live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering AWS reInvent 2019. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services and Intel, along with its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE, Lisa Martin with Stu Miniman. We are live on the show floor at AWS reInvent 19 with thousands of people. Stu and I have one of our CUBE alum back joining us. We've got Gail Haberman, Senior Director of Cloud Services from Nutanix. Welcome back. Thank you for having me. And you're on brand with your Nutanix pin. Running for president of Nutanix right here. <laughs> All right. So, here we are, day three of reInvent. 65,000 or so folks here. Yeah. This show floor has been nonstop for days. Right. Big theme has been about Outpost yeah. and what Outpost and what AWS is doing there. But Nutanix, you guys have been talking about hybrid cloud for years. Yeah. What does all of the buzz about Outpost, what does that mean for you guys? Yeah, I think uh, this GA really validates our strategy and what we've been hearing from customers for many years around the need for hybrid and more broadly, I think, consistency. Consistency across environments as a way or means to actually adopt hybrid uh, in an effective manner for, as a long-term strategy. And I think uh, AWS now realizing that and working in this direction, we see that with Outpost and with uh, what they're announcing with Local as well. The idea is that you really need to have a consistent way to manage across different environments and ideally same constructs as well. And that's what they're doing specifically with Outpost. Uh, the direction we've been taking is the same where our software can run both on-prem but also in public cloud, in edge, so that the same applications, whether traditional or modern, can run in the same way so that not only mobility is easy, but people can use the same skill sets that they've developed over many years uh, across different environments. Yeah, Gil, it's, it's been fascinating for me to watch the maturation of the market. Of course, Nutanix's original design was, let's take these hyperscale type of architectures and bring it to the enterprise. Now we're seeing the intersection of what's happening at the enterprise and the public cloud and the environment, but you know, dial back a few years, the first time Nutanix came to the show, it was right after the acquisition of a small company called Xi. Um, and it was like, okay, it was exciting, but the Nutanix and Amazon connection was, we're trying to all figure out how the dots go together. Fast forward to today, uh, you know, bring us up to you know, how Amazon, Nutanix, and those solutions work together for your customers. Sure, so the latest initiative that we have announced as early access is Nutanix Clusters, where we use our software not only on-prem now, but also on AWS bare metal instances. So for those who don't know, our software for many years have collapsed storage and compute into a single pool of resources that customers can deploy very easily and scale out as needed on a variety of hardware platforms traditionally in their data centers. Now we use the exact same software but on AWS bare metal instances and what that means is that the same applications as is can be used either on-prem or public cloud so it's really easy for customers for their business and mission critical applications. Yeah, I, I want to highlight a thing you talked about there, that the bare metal service from Amazon, which is a relatively new thing, my understanding that was designed for the VMware on AWS, but they're opening up for ecosystem partners to right. do, and you said Nutanix clusters. Is that what I had heard about at .next and was called Xi clusters before? Yes, as part of this early access, we've renamed this um, to Nutanix clusters, but yes, it's the same idea. Uh, and the idea is really that customers can now use our software uh, in AWS. You see other cloud vendors also starting to offer bare metal services for this exact reason. And we are really evolving our company as well where our software itself is going to be portable. So customers know they deploy our software, for example, on-prem today, they have a direct path to AWS and other clouds in the future. Because we have heard from many customers that perhaps re-platform, let's say, to AWS, now they're not sure what to do if they ever wanted to go to another vendor, right? Um, so what we're trying to do is have a single platform that can, go, uh, can support multiple clouds and also the software itself has to be portable and so that's the path we're on. For that portability, what are some of the key use cases that it will enable customers to achieve? Yeah, so many, many times now we hear that customers uh, are not looking to manage their physical infrastructure anymore. And so in cases where 
perhaps they acquired multiple companies and they have kind of a data center sprawl, they want to consolidate. One option is to consolidate into a, data, a single data center, but another option now would be to consolidate into AWS location near them or in the region that they need. But the key here, in the case of clusters, is that the same VMs, same third-party integrations they've had, daily practices, can now work simply managed on AWS as opposed to managing their own data center. So it eases the operational burden, but it does not require a big lift and re-platforming to achieve that. Right, yeah, so, so I was hearing, sorry Steve, I was hearing one of the loud and clear when you were saying that operational efficiency was, seems pretty loud and clear as a key benefit. Absolutely. All right, so Gil, what you're describing there really reminds me of what I'm hearing from customers when they're talking about one of the reasons that they're adopting Kubernetes. Uh, of course, Amazon has you know, various ways to leverage Kubernetes, especially EKS. They announced the Fargate uh, being supported there. Um, I know Nutanix has Carbon. Do Carbon, Nutanix clusters, how, how does that go together in the whole Kubernetes story? Yeah, so when I talk about clusters, it's really the, the entire software that we have that can be used across and the cost environments, and that software stack includes many aspects to it. Of course, the core is just having very resilient infrastructure software that you can run applications on, but it has many other faces to it, and one of them is containers. So like you run virtual machines, either on our hypervisor or third-party hypervisors, you can also run containers on any Kubernetes or our Kubernetes that we support as part of that software, and that whole thing is portable. So really what I'm talking about here is very foundational and definitely supports Carbon as well, so customers know that both traditional and modern applications can, uh, can be ported across clouds. Give us some customer examples where you've seen a legacy enterprise that has to transform in order to stay in business yeah. is working with Nutanix to do just that. Yeah, so we have uh, many customers, especially on the high end of the market, to your point, pharmaceuticals with security concerns, financial services that want to modernize, but they have very heavy investments in uh, their traditional and business critical applications. And now that their cloud journey is maturing, they want to address those workloads. Those workloads are very hard to migrate or to re-platform specifically, and so they're looking for this way to maintain all the investments that they've done over years, but also get the benefits of public clouds where it's appropriate, either for migration or for bursting. And so having that same software that can run the same VMs as is across multiple environments is a perfect solution for them. We, you know, eliminating the, the need to utilize different cloud native services. Maybe they'll do that over time, but right now th this really helps them save millions because we ha hear from many customers, to your point, the CIO has the mandate to do this transformation, but I can't do it, or my teams have resistance to do it because of this investment. Yeah, Gil, I'm glad, glad you're hitting on that transformation <laughs> note, because Nutanix itself has gone through a bit of a transformation recently. Uh, all software, uh, that model, it, it feels like we've kind of gone through that transition. What, what does that help Nutanix learn uh, when, when you're working with your customers that you know, transformation is not easy, that yeah. the keynote talked about that you need leadership involved and this just can't be an incremental thing. You need to take you know, bold moves to move things forward and Nutanix itself has gone through some own, of its own transformations. Yeah, absolutely. As always with Nutanix, we're very aggressive with execution, both in product velocity and here also in terms of business models. So we've moved from hardware to software and now to subscription we find that customers absolutely love the notion that they have a lot more flexibility in terms of subscription. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we're evolving this further to support multiple clouds. And because we believe the, the five to 10 years ahead of us are going to be all about cloud everywhere rather than just on-prem, uh, we need to support that in terms of our model and so we're going through that transformation ourselves. One of the things also that was talked about this week is just, well, maybe not talked about, is multi-cloud, right? That's a kind of a four-letter word for Amazon. But it yeah. is often an operating model that we see a lot of customers are in for various reasons. Maybe not strategic, maybe it's more we've inherited this or an enterprise has acquired right. smaller companies that have myriad cloud solutions. And this is more of a reality than anything else. Some of the many announcements that AWS has made this week. You talked about this sort of validating the direction that Nutanix has been going in, but from, what does this signal to you in terms of, of 
Amazon's own evolution? Yes, I think we are really seeing an evolution you know, while resisting the change to some extent. So I agree with you, multi-cloud was absolute no-no, hybrid was a no-no, now hybrid is embraced. I think for hybrid, they really are trying to reach for greater adoption for, I think the hard part, like what I mentioned before, business and mission critical applications, that's the main thing. I think with multi, there's still resistance, but it's absolutely critical. Like you're saying, every EBC meeting that I've he been here, customers talk about multi-cloud because of organic adoption or evolution or acquisitions. And so it's absolutely critical to have tooling, like our hybrid cloud services, that support multiple clouds. So we have services that support governance across clouds, uh, cost optimization, security compliance, automation, self-service, all these things really help custom, customers drive towards a more unified or harmonized way of managing multiple environments, and it's absolutely critical, I agree. We look into like a magic crystal ball, kind of in the spirit of evolution. We, we look at cloud 1.0. John Furrier talks a lot about cloud 2.0. Yeah. What, if, if you look, say down the road the next five years, yeah. what do you think the state of cloud is going to look like? Yeah, I think, our vision has been, and I really see this materializing as cloud everywhere, rather than thinking about cloud as a centralized place where that is the cloud. Uh, if you think about even uh, edge requiring heavy local processing, real compute, real storage, uh, very sensitive in terms of latency for networking, uh, maybe our cars even, right, are going to be a little mobile data centers. And so there's going to be a need to have cloud everywhere while still offloading some stuff for uh, centralized processing. So we really need to find a way to bring that cloud everywhere, and what we've been working at Nutanix is towards that vision of bringing that platform that has strong resiliency, uh, uh, very good latency sensitive workloads everywhere we might need it uh, in preparation for that vision, and I think it's going to be very exciting to see how all these vendors and customers evolve their environments over time. It's going to be, I think, very different from what we thought about 20 years ago, for sure. Do you see any one industry in particular as really ripe for this, to be able to, to not just bring cloud everywhere, but to live it and really completely flip an industry on its head? Anything that really kind of pops into your mind? Um, I'm not sure. I think. In terms of vision, it's going to be across industries, but the, the more you have applications that do require that edge processing um, to be, again, low latency and robust, so IoT use cases, for example, with, with retail, uh, maybe manufacturing and so on, I think we're going to see these guys lead the, the, the wave here because they simply cannot offload everything to the cloud, uh, but others are going to follow because it just makes sense, and if it's not uh, an anomaly, then they'll be more comfortable in that process. So much change to come, but also so much opportunity. Gil, thank you for joining Stu and me on theCUBE this morning. Great having, uh, great being here, thank you very much. Our pleasure. For Stu Miniman, I'm Lisa Martin, and you're watching theCUBE live from AWS reInvent 19 from Vegas. Thanks for watching.